Welcome to the online causal inference seminar. Uh, today we have Paul Rosenbaum from the University of Pennsylvania and he will speak about replication evidence factors in observational studies. Uh, we are very excited uh, about this talk. It covers an extremely important topic. Um, yeah, he will also stop from time to time to take uh, some questions from the audience. And uh, if we have time left at the end of the talk, we will allow for some more questions. All right, that's it from my side. I'm now switching over to Guillaume who will handle the questions. Thanks, Dominique. Um, so as Dominique mentioned, uh, we are very lucky uh, to have Dylan Small today uh, manning the Q&A. So he'll, uh, he'll answer uh, some of the questions in the Q&A uh, directly. So please uh, don't hesitate uh, to ask questions. Um, we will also um, select a few questions to ask directly to Paul. Um, so if your question is selected, I will uh, ask you to raise your hand um, through the chat. Uh, so please don't, don't uh, raise your hand unless I've asked you to do so. Um, all right, that's pretty much it uh, on my end. Uh, Paul, you may start whenever you're ready. Um, let's see. Did we lose the... So it's a pleasure to be with you today. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person. I'd like to talk today about replication and evidence factors in observational studies, and I'll tell you what I mean by that in a moment. Um, this is a talk in two parts. The first part is about replication and how biases can replicate. Uh, it's mostly conceptual. It's fairly brief. It's not original to me, so I'm going to quote quite a bit from other people. Nor are the views expressed widely believed, but they're not opposed by an articulate position, but rather by a tendency to not want to think about things like this. Um, because biases can replicate, Replication should not be repetition. That's the main piece of the first part. Uh, the second part is about evidence factors. It's really the heart of the talk. Uh, it's slightly technical, not very technical, and a little longer. Uh, once we realize that uh, replication is not about repetition, uh, a natural question is whether an observational study can replicate itself. Can there be two independent analyses of the very same data that combine to be stronger evidence of cause and effect than either is on its own? Um, the goal is to bring into formal statistics an important aspect of causal inference that is very much present but is currently informal. Um, so I'm going to begin with uh, two facts, very familiar facts, and a question about them. The first fact is that association does not imply causation. Um, treatment received and outcome exhibited may be associated in the absence of an effect caused by the treatment. Uh, in statistical terms, the absence, uh, uh, in the absence of random assignment, causal effects are not identified by observed associations. The observed associations, the observed observable distributions are um, could be the same and yet be compatible either with a causal effect or with bias treatment assignment or some combination of the two. The second fact is smoking causes lung cancer and we know this. In fact, we know this as well as we know anything. Uh, and we know this mostly from the very sort of studies that uh, uh, were described in fact one where association does not uh, entail causation. So the question is, how can fact one and fact two both be true? They sound contradictory. Um, let's take a look at uh, a claimed replication via three observational studies. So in the 1970s, 80s, 90s, there were uh, several studies, DARP, DATOS, and TOPS, which uh, studied large numbers of people and claimed uh, that uh, uh, clinical treatment for uh, addiction mostly to heroin, but in later studies also to cocaine, was effective in reducing um, addict addiction. Uh, this is sometimes cited as replicated evidence of treatment effectiveness. So Hubbard and uh, uh, wrote, uh, the general finding from DARPs and TOPs that treatment duration of at least three months is associated with statistically and clinically more positive outcomes supports the inference of treatment effectiveness. The following analysis retests this hypothesis using DATOS and reaches the same conclusion. Um, so what should we make of the fact that three big studies um, uh, 
reached the same, found the same association uh, three times. The National Academy of Sciences in 1999 and 2001 published two reports um, that discussed a lot of things, but one of the things they discussed was whether the, uh, that conclusion was warranted on the basis of the evidence from these studies. So Mansky was the chair of the committee and uh, the committee report wrote, the RAND study compares post-treatment average drug use of members of the top sample who completed their treatment programs with drug use of top subjects who began treatment but dropped out within three months. Uh, suppose, however, that treatment dropouts are more predisposed to drug use than those who complete treatment. If dropouts are more severely addicted or less motivated or have fewer social supports than those who complete treatment, the observed differences in post-treatment drug use of dropouts and completers may reflect differences in the characteristics of the two groups, not the effect of the treatment programs. They continued, uh, the people who complete the treatment program uh, may be those who are most likely to reduce their drug use whether or not they receive treatment. The true treatment uh, effect may be smaller than estimated by RAND or even zero. So this is the claim we started with, that the comparison is ambiguous, that associations don't uh, entail causation, and in particular in this case, the most plausible treatment effect, namely that uh, the treatment is working, uh, is exactly what you'd expect from the most plausible bias, namely that people who are not that interested in uh, ending their addictions drop out of treatment. Um, so we said this, um, finding this same association three times is of very limited value if in fact it's exactly the same ambiguity and it's present in all three studies. Um, so I wanted to quote a bit from some people who have talked about this, one statistician, one epidemiologist, one mathematician, and uh, two philosophers. The statistician is William Cochran. Uh, he wrote the combined evidence on a question that has to be decided mainly from observational studies will usually consist of a heterogeneous collection of results of varying quality, each bearing on some consequence of the causal hypothesis. The investigator cannot avoid an attempt to weigh the evidence for and against since some results are so vulnerable to bias that they should be given low weight even if supported by routine tests of significance. So I wanna emphasize in this thing a heterogeneous collection results of varying quality, each bearing on some consequence of the causal hypothesis which may have multiple consequences and his um, sense that uh, uh, just looking at p-values isn't gonna help us sort this out. The um, epidemiologist was Mervyn Susser. Uh, he wrote, the epidemiologist seeks consistency of results in a variety of repeated tests. Consistency is present if the result is not dislodged in the face of diversity in times, places, circumstances, and people, as well as of research design. Uh, the strength of this argument rests in the fact that diverse approaches produce similar results. So once again, he's emphasizing diversity opposed to the uh, top status uh, uh, DARP uh, sequence where in fact the same study was done uh, three times. Um, the mathematician was obviously not talking about observational studies. He was George Polya and he was talking about heuristics in mathematics. So heuristics in mathematics means the process of reasoning that goes on before we have a proof. How do we decide how to construct a proof? How do we decide what's worth proving? How do we decide what's probably not true and not worth proving? That kind of reasoning. He's quite explicit that this argument is Bayesian, but without the numbers. So uh, if you uh, plugged in the numbers in Bayes' formula, you would get um, the kind of conclusions he's getting, but he's giving you qualitative advice out of Bayes' formula. He says, our confidence in a theorem can only increase as a new consequence of the theorem is established. The increase in our confidence brought about by a new confirmation, or if we wish, the inductive evidence furnished by this new confirmation, will vary inversely as the plausibility of the new consequence appraised in light of the previously verified consequences. That consequence, which on the basis of preceding verifications stands the best chance of refuting the theorem, will disclose the strongest inductive evidence if it's confirmed in spite of forebodings. This will be the case when the new consequence has no immediate relation to the old ones, when it is removed from the preceding, when this is not only a new consequence, but of a new kind. So once again, he's emphasizing the importance of diversity uh, of evidence. Um, so let's go back to our original question. How does an empirical association demonstrate a causal effect if that association is compatible with either an effect or a bias? How do you prove that what you just saw was an association 
produced by an effect and not one produced by a bias. Um, our first philosopher Wittgenstein said, a picture held us captive and we could not get outside it for it lay in our language and language seemed to repeat it to us inexorably. Uh, what is the picture here? The picture here is that observed associations demonstrate conclusions as, as in a deduction and a proof that the meaning of an observational study is clear on the day it's published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, and uh, that it uh, has demonstrated something at that very point. Um, how do philosophers help us break free from a picture? They do this by offering alternative pictures. These alternative pictures are not intended as, as a substitute for the original picture. They're intended to uh, reflect that there are multiple perspectives and that we do not have to think within the framework of the first picture. A philosopher of logic, Susan Hauck, uh, offered uh, this picture in her book, Evidence and Inquiry. So it's the picture of a crossword puzzle. Um, so I'm going to describe Hauk's conclusions in language she doesn't use because her language a bit clashes with statistical language. Words like independent are sort of heavily overburdened between the two. So I'm going to use our terminology to describe her conclusions. Her first point is that the individual clues in a crossword puzzle do not identify um, the entries. So for example, 16 across uh, is German wheels in four letters. Uh, we might guess uh, 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 an answer to that. It turns out to be Audi, but it could just, just as easily have been Opel, right? Both of which are German cars, uh, which fit in four letters and 16 across. No amount of staring at uh, German wheels at the clue will actually settle that. Um, one across is Desert Storm Missile in four letters. What is it? We might guess that it's a scud, but uh, uh, we could be wrong just as we would have been wrong in 16 across if we had guessed Opal. The clues are not identifying the entries. Uh, how would we get more information? We might fill in other entries, right? Um, so uh, one down is cry noisily in three letters with perhaps beginning with S. Uh, four down is uh, hound. We don't yet know whether it's the animal or the activity in three letters, perhaps beginning with D. 17 across is an optimistic viewpoint to look upon in 10 letters. So we might guess sob for uh, uh, cry noisily, dog for hound, and bright side as the optimistic viewpoint to look upon. Um, so the first uh, point she's making is that the coherence among the entries is an important element in uh, uh, filling in the crossword puzzle. A second point she makes is that the coherence lacks sharp boundaries. Bright side doesn't intersect with scud, and yet it provides fairly strong confirmation of scud because it intersects appropriately with sob and with dog, which meet scud uh, uh, appropriately. Um, so that's her first point. Um, there is a lack of sharp boundaries in coherence. The reasoning we're going through, coherence, is circular, uh, but it's not viciously circular. So vicious circularity would be A implies B, B implies A, therefore A and B are both true. Uh, that's an error in logic because in fact A and B could both be false. Uh, if the only evidence we had for scud is that it meets sob appropriately, and the only evidence we had for sob is it meets scud appropriately, then we would have very little evidence uh, for uh, the overall uh, entries. Uh, her next point is that the evidence may be demarcated. That is, we can set aside the evidence provided by sob and ask what evidence do we have for scud besides the fact that it meets sob appropriately. Well, we can have the evidence from the clue, we have the appropriate intersection with dog. We have the appropriate intersection of dog with bright side. So we actually have a lot of evidence for scud aside from its appropriate intersection with sob. In the same way, we have a lot of evidence for sob aside from its appropriate intersection with scud. So therefore, when these two uh, uh, entries meet appropriately, it's actually news. Right? It's actually informative and strengthening of the evidence. Um, a funny thing about a crossword puzzle is the crossword puzzle is always not identified. 
And yet the lack of identification is diminishing as we fill in more of the crossword puzzle. It is in principle conceivable that we could have two ways to fill in the entire crossword puzzle compatible with the clues, compatible with intersections, but it becomes remotely implausible as we fill in more and more of the um, crossword puzzle. Wittgenstein, one last time, uh, light dawns gradually over the whole as opposed to the picture of deduction and proof. Uh, this is a one slide example of replication that is not repetition. Uh, in the 1950s and 1960s, many studies found strong associations between smoking and lung cancer. So that's one entry in your crossword puzzle. Uh, they also found weaker associations with cardiovascular disease, which are now believed to be causal, and with cirrhosis of the liver, which are now believed to be spurious, uh, the thought being that uh, smokers uh, drank more and hence had more cirrhosis. Um, what would be another entry in the crossword puzzle? Well, in the 1960s, the tobacco industry was unhappy with the fact that women weren't smoking very much, and they launched several advertising campaigns to change that, one of which, the most notorious of which, was the Virginia Slims campaign, You've Come a Long Way Baby, which was launched in 1967. So this is a campaign that showed uh, attractive, uh, uh, glamorous, uh, slender uh, women smoking as an appetite suppressant, uh, uh, being independent and smoking despite convention. And it was fairly successful and women smoked more, not as much as men. In 1997, 30 years later, uh, about the right time for lung cancer, Baylor and Gornick wrote, uh, for lung cancer death rates for women 55 and older have increased almost four times the 1970 rate, but the rates for males over 55 and the rates for other cancer sites show no such dramatic change. So this is another kind of study. It's certainly fallible, could have another explanation, but the reasons why this study would be fallible seem to have little to do with the original studies and why they might be fallible. These are like two entries in a crossword, meeting appropriately and therefore providing uh, mutual support. So the theme of this first part of the talk has been replication is not repetition. Uh, if we, uh, uh, repeat exactly, we could re easily repeat the biases exactly. If we cannot eliminate a bias, perhaps we can change it or vary it just to see if the treatment effect reappears or if it disappears when a particular bias has been removed. Um, this raises a key question. If replication is not about doing the study twice, if it's not about collecting more data, if it's not about increasing the sample size, then ask, can one observational study replicate itself? Uh, can one observational study conduct two inconclusive analyses subject to different biases in such a way that the evidence against bias and in favor of a treatment effect becomes measurably stronger? So we're going to turn to a running example of, uh, uh, throughout the rest of the talk, which is uh, from a paper I wrote in 2017. Does smoking cause periodontal disease? Well, a variety of people claim that it does. Uh, we'll look at data from the 2011-2012 uh, NHANES survey, where they measured periodontal disease fairly carefully. The outcome is a measure of periodontal disease. They looked at 28 teeth, excluding wisdom teeth. They looked at six locations on each tooth. And at each location, they determined whether there was a loss of attachment of at least four millimeters or a pocket depth of at least four millimeters. So these are measures of the separation of gums and teeth, right? So uh, each person has 28 times, seven, times six locations, and the uh, outcome is the percent of diseased locations. So it's between zero and 100% for each person. We're going to look at 441 matched pairs of a daily smoker and a never smoker. Uh, daily smokers smoked every day for the past 30 days, uh, whereas never smokers smoked fewer than 100 cigarettes in their lives. Daily smokers began smoking on average 30 years ago, and 90% of the ones we're looking at have been smoking for at least 14.9 uh, years. Uh, pairs were matched for age, gender, uh, five categories of education, income, and black race, although it's easy to think of lots of other things we might want to adjust for. Uh, we'll also take note of the number of cigarettes smoked by the smoker in each pair. So this is a box plot of smoker minus control pair differences in periodontal disease. So for an individual, it's zero to 100%, but for pairs, it's minus 100% to 100%, depending on what the difference is. Uh, the center line here is at zero. You're seeing a box plot that shifted to the right. 
smokers uh, tend to have uh, more periodontal disease than non-smokers. Um, could this just be an accident of chance? Well, if we compute uh, Wilcoxon signed rank test in the conventional way, I'm quoting a p-value of one in a 10,000, uh, but in fact, the p-value is below machine precision. Um, the point estimate associated with Wilcoxon statistic is 13.5% with a confidence interval of 10 to 17% as a shift in the amount of periodontal disease. So we know the differences tend to be positive and we know it would be hard to dismiss that as chance, but it could be something other than an effect caused by smoking. That would be the interesting question. Is it caused by smoking? Um, what else could it be caused by? Well, maybe smokers uh, by smoking are exhibiting a lack of concern for their health. And maybe they exhibit this lack of concern for their health in more than one way. Maybe they also don't floss their teeth. And maybe we're looking at the effects of not flossing one's teeth rather than the effects of smoking as uh, we saw previously with um, uh, uh, cirrhosis of the liver uh, being associated with smoking but not causal and so. Um, we can imagine a randomized experiment, obviously we couldn't conduct it. It would flip a fair coin independently 441 times to assign one person in each pair to the status of smoker or control. There would then be two to the 441 possible treatment assignments. We could write them down uh, in our uh, 441 pairs. A probability distribution on those treatment assignments would be a attaching a probability to each of the possible treatment assignments, and a randomized experiment would attach the same probability, two to the minus 441, to every one of those treatment assignments. Um, comparing smokers uh, to controls, ignoring the amount smoked, using Wilcoxon statistic, we got a p-value which was zero to machine precision. What that's really saying is the chance that uh, Wilcoxon statistic would be as large as it is if the null hypothesis of no treatment effect were true and uh, uh, we had run a randomized experiment that has a minuscule chance, chance uh, far less than one in 10,000. It's very unlikely that randomization would have produced the box plots we saw. And the same is true for the confidence intervals. We're not entitled to that p-value because we didn't randomize. Um, a sensitivity analysis is asking about how far from randomization we'd have to move in order to uh, see the box plot we actually saw. So this is going to have a parameter gamma. Gamma is going to measure our departure from random assignment. Uh, we're imagining that we have independent coin flips, but they're not fair any longer. Instead of having 50-50 chance of getting uh, the treatment, people have different chances. And gamma equal to 1.25 means the probability that a particular person in a pair gets the treatment is not 50-50, but something in the interval 0.44 to 0.56. Uh, in a pair, 1.25 for gamma is equivalent to an unobserved covariate that doubles the odds of smoking and doubles the odds of a positive difference in periodontal disease. So it's not an enormous bias, but it's also not a trivial bias. This is not a trivial unobserved covariate we're talking about. I'm not going to explain the details of that uh, one claim uh, in this talk. Um, this is creating for us what? Not one distribution on the treatment assignments, but a set of probability distributions on the treatment assignments where we've picked uh, probabilities for each pair someplace in this interval and then uh, deduced uh, the probabilities of the uh, possible uh, 2 to the 441 treatment assignments. Uh, we don't know which one of those uh, distributions is the right one, even if we uh, thought we knew that the magnitude gamma. Uh, so uh, for any one of them, we could compute the p-value for Wilcoxon statistic. But since we don't know which one we should refer to, we pick the largest one. We pick the largest p-value and we say bias of magnitude gamma could at most produce a p-value of p-bar uh, uh, if in fact the null hypothesis were true. At gamma equal to 1.25 in the example we were looking at, the maximum possible p-value is now above machine precision, but it's about 10 to the minus 16th. So a bias of that magnitude couldn't begin to produce the box plot we saw. Uh, at gamma equal to 2.75, the maximum p-value is just about to cross the conventional 0.05 level. It's still less than 0.05, but if we made it 2.76, it would be above 0.05. That corresponds to an unobserved covariate that increases the odds of smoking by uh, fivefold and increases the odds of a positive difference in periodontal disease by fivefold. So that's a fairly hefty unobserved covariate doing a lot of work. Um, is that all the evidence we have from this study? Well, actually, we have another comparison. 
Consider the smoker minus control pair difference in periodontal disease in relationship to the amount smoked by the smoker. Remember, pairs are matched for lots of stuff, including age. Uh, do we see larger differences in periodontal disease in pairs where the smoker smoked more cigarettes per day? So an alternative study design might have taken this as the primary comparison. In fact, the Tomar study was mostly concerned with the amount smoked and just made non-smokers into zeros. Um, so this is a picture, the same uh, pair differences in periodontal disease from minus 100% to 100%, but they're now plotted against how many cigarettes did the smoker smoke in a pair. And what are you seeing? You're seeing that when the smoker didn't smoke very much, he doesn't look very much different from a non-smoker. The difference is close to zero. But as the smoker is smoking more and more cigarettes, the difference is increasing. This is that same picture. The points are in exactly the same place, but I've removed the uh, low as smooth and I've put horizontal and vertical lines. These are at the quintiles. So there's 20% of the data down here, 20% of the data up here, 20% of the data here, 20% of the data here. The um, cross-cut uh, test and odds ratio are going to look at the counts in the four corners. And it turns out the odds ratio in the four corners is about 3.65. So that's a fairly strong association between the amount smoked by the smoker uh, and uh, the um, uh, uh, difference in periodontal disease. Uh, there is a randomization p-value for that uh, test if we had randomly assigned uh, doses to smokers, and that p-value is 0.0022. The cross-cut statistic turns out to be a very good statistic to use in sensitivity analysis, and again, I'm not planning on explaining that in this talk. Um, we could imagine uh, another randomized experiment where we randomly assign doses, uh, cigarettes per day, to the pairs, right? We could do that in 441 factorial ways. A randomized experiment would have uh, assigned those uh, uh, doses with equal probabilities and would have produced uh, a probability distribution on the 441 factorial possible treatment assignments that gave every one of them the same probability, 1 over 441 factorial. Um, saying the same thing in different language, in a randomized experiment, the odds of dose D in a pair versus dose D prime in a pair of cigarettes smoked is the same for all pairs in a randomized experiment. Uh, the quoted p-value says that were that true, where this is a randomized experiment in which there was no effect of the treatment, uh, about one randomization in 500 would produce a cross-cut statistic as big as the one we observed. Uh, so that's fairly small. We're not entitled to that p-value because we didn't actually randomly assign doses. Uh, how sensitive is this comparison to biased assignment of the doses? Um, so we can instead imagine that the odds of dose D versus D prime of cigarettes in, pair, in different pairs uh, differ by at most a factor of gamma prime. Then when gamma prime is one, uh, we have random assignment. Um, there's now a set of distributions, no longer a single distribution on the possible uh, uh, dose assignments. And each of those uh, distributions gives rise to a p-value for the cross-cut statistic. We find the maximum such p-value. That is to say, we're making the assertion, if the bias in dose assignment is at most gamma prime, then the chance that we will falsely reject the hypothesis of no effect at level alpha is at most alpha. Um, it turns out that the maximum possible p-value uh, is very close to 0.05. Uh, when gamma prime is 1.6. So if we made it 1.7, it would cross uh, the conventional 0.05 um, uh, level. So we've been looking at these two pictures, right? We've been looking at the box plot of the pair differences. We've been looking at the scatter plot of the uh, uh, amount uh, smoked related to the pair differences. Um, what I want to convince you of in the rest of this talk is that this is as if we had done two completely different studies, two different investigative teams, looked at two unrelated pieces of evidence, reported their results in two separate journal articles. We can combine the evidence from these two uh, uh, as if they came from different uh, studies using meta-analytic techniques, even though, in fact, these two pictures are perfectly uh, dependent. If I project the points to the left, in the scatter plot, I get the box plot. 
So there's perfect dependence, and yet despite that, uh, the two sensitivity analyses will combine as if they came from different studies. Um, so that's what I just said. We want to combine the two sensitivity analyses without adding any new assumptions at this stage. The assumption I most want to avoid adding at this stage is the assumption that whether a person smokes is unrelated to the amount they would smoke if they did smoke. That would be a crazy assumption. We don't want to have that assumption in this uh, analysis. And uh, we need to take care to prevent that from sneaking in somehow. The basic claim is that the upper bounds on the two p-values we computed can be combined as if they came from unrelated studies. Uh, the claim re uh, relies on the assumptions in the two separate sensitivity analyses and also on the structure of the study, the scatter plot, the box plot structure. It also applies in a lot of parallel contexts. Um, this is the basic claim uh, uh, stated somewhat informally. If the null hypothesis were true, if the bias in the smoke of control comparison were at most gamma, if the bias in the dose assignments were at most gamma prime, then the pair of upper bounds on the p-values is stochastically larger than the uniform distribution on the unit square. So that's not quite the same as they're being independent, but it's what you need to have if, in fact, you want to combine them as if they were two uh, independent tests. The claim is that no matter how you build the joint distribution, uh, the pair of p-values satisfies this feature that they look like uh, independent p-values p-values in the sense of being stochastically larger than the uniform distribution on the square. Um, so before I get into uh, actually showing you that this is true, uh, let me do one, okay? So let me show you the analysis I have in mind, uh, and uh, then we'll talk about why it's a reasonable analysis. You remember the Wilcoxon analysis became sensitive at gamma equal to 2.75, and the crosscut analysis involving the dose became sensitive at 1.6. So what we're doing now is we're looking at those same sensitivity parameters for the Wilcoxon statistic, those sensitivity parameters for the crosscut statistic. We're taking the two p-values we got from those two things and we're combining them with a meta-analytic technique as if we were doing a meta-analysis on unrelated studies. The particular meta-analytic technique is the truncated product of p-values, which is the generalization of Fisher's method of combining p-values. Fisher's method takes the product of the p-values and works out its distribution, gives, gives you a new p-value based on that. The truncated product takes the product of those p-values that are smaller than a truncation point, here point two, and uses that as the combining statistic works out its distribution. Turns out this is better than Fisher's method in sensitivity analyses. Again, I'm not going to explain that in detail. Um, what we're looking at in here is the uh, combined p-values from our meta-analysis, taking one study, taking the other study, although they're really the same study. Right? And what do you notice? The first thing you notice is that this p-value of 0.05 is occurring here, which is a larger uh, bias than the crosscut analysis was sensitive to and a larger bias than the Wilcoxon analysis was sensitive to. So the combined analysis is insensitive to larger biases than either of the component analyses. So we've had measurably stronger evidence of a treatment effect and not a bias because it takes more bias to explain the combined analysis than it took to explain either one of them. More than that, we can demarcate the evidence just as we did in the crossword puzzle. We can say, what if the crosscut statistic is totally worthless? What if it's totally biased, biased to an infinite degree, right? Uh, we find that the results are still insensitive to bias, even with infinite bias in the crosscut statistic, providing the bias in the Wilcoxon statistic is at most 2.5. So we have strong evidence, even if we throw away one of our comparisons, one of our two studies. In the same way, if the Wilcoxon statistic faced infinite biases, the crosscut analysis is still insensitive to bias at 1.3. Uh, so uh, e either part of our evidence could be facing infinite biases, and yet we still have strong evidence for the conclusion that smoking causes periodontal disease. So this would be a good moment for me to stop for a second and take one question if there is one. Um, so we don't have any questions at the moment. Uh, perhaps one thing that that, that you can uh, uh, clarify a little bit is, um, so uh, 
we, we don't have a value for for uh, for gamma. So this is something that uh, we have to uh, you know um, it's uh, we're not supplying gamma. It's something that we get uh, from the from the sensitivity analysis. So how should we think about um, about that value? Uh, like sure. yeah, what does it represent and so the gamma is an attempt to move away from two analyses. One is to do a randomization inference and it, say there's no unmeasured bias, which is taking gamma equal to one. And the other is leaping to the conclusion that because association does not imply causation, that an observational study uh, immediately uh, is susceptible uh, to uh, alternative explanations. It's an attempt to replace that by a numeric value which says how sensitive is this particular study, how much bias would be needed in this particular study. So for example, the gamma equal to 2.75 is giving you a magnitude of bias that would need to be present and is informative about your data and uh, uh, how much bias would be needed in your study to explain away the results. So, okay, if, there, if there's no further questions, let me move on to uh, give a feeling for where this all comes from. Uh, so this is a, um, a tiny example drawn from the actual study. So this tiny example has two pairs rather than uh, 441 pairs. In the first pair, um, the uh, smoker smoked 40 cigarettes per day. In the second pair, the uh, smoker smoked eight cigarettes per day. Uh, the actual study is just larger, uh, not different in concept. Uh, these are the actual people who uh, are gonna be put into those treatment positions in some way or other. Uh, so the first pair consists of two men in their 50s. They're not black. They have some college, meaning an associate's degree, two years of college. Uh, and their incomes are more than five times the poverty level, um, which is where Anne Haynes caps income for confidentiality. Um, the second pair consists of two black women in their 60s, both with high school degrees uh, and incomes uh, somewhat below the poverty level. The, larger, the actual study is just larger. It's clear that we want to keep the pairs intact as we go along, right? Because the two people in the pairs look more similar than the two people in different pairs. Um, a study design is going to permute these people into the treatment positions on the previous slide. Um, it's going to do that while keeping the pairs intact. Uh, so here are our treatment positions. How many ways can we permute people into uh, positions. Well, it's not four factorial, 24 possible ways, because we want to keep the pairs intact. We have to uh, assign a treatment within each pair, smoker or control. We can do that in two ways in the first pair, two ways in the second pair, uh, two squared ways in total. And then we can assign uh, 40 cigarettes to a pair or eight cigarettes to a pair in two ways, two factorial ways, uh, which gives us eight possible treatment assignments. There's actually a group of uh, four by four permutation matrices, which would permute people into this uh, set of treatment assignments. That's the group G. We could run a randomized experiment th with this structure. What would that mean? We pick at random an element from G to assign treatments to our four people. Um, without random assignment, each of these two treatment assignments could be biased. Uh, the actual study is just larger. Um, so a treatment assignment is a permutation matrix, one of these guys, right? has exactly one one, 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 one in each row and each column, otherwise it's zero. Uh, it operates on the people one, two, three, four by permuting them, right? And in particular, this is the permutation matrix which per takes the third person and gives them to the treatment position while uh, being a, a smoker of 40 cigarettes per day. Uh, takes the um, a second person, makes them the smoker of eight cigarettes per day, keeps the pairs intact. Um, Fisher's null hypothesis of no treatment effect says what? It says that the um, uh, assignment of uh, people to treatment positions moves them around the experimental design but doesn't affect their teeth, right? If you have diseased teeth, they're going to be diseased anyway and smoking isn't doing it. That's the null hypothesis. We're interested in whether it's true, but it means if we permuted people uh, uh, around, uh, their degree of periodontal disease would simply move with them. So the first person uh, has 63% of their teeth uh, uh, locations are uh, diseased. Uh, as that person is moved around, if the hypothesis is true, all that happens is uh, they move to a new position in the design. It saves a lot of otherwise unneeded notation if we write our test statistic under the null hypothesis as a function of the treatment assignment, a function of the permutation matrix, because everything about the person is going with them as they move around and not changing under the null hypothesis. 
Um, so if I use this treatment assignment applied to these people, I would simply permute uh, the uh, extent of uh, periodontal disease uh, with the people to their new treatment positions. There's actually a subgroup of the eight permutations. This is the subgroup of permutation matrices that permute smoker control within a pair, but leave the dose ordering the same. It has uh, four elements, two squared elements. Uh, the real problem is just larger. It has, there's another group with uh, two to the 441 possible elements. Here's another subgroup of our group of uh, eight permutation matrices. It's the group that leaves the smoker control assignments alone, but permutes the 40 versus eight cigarettes between the two pairs. It has two factorial elements or two elements um, uh, which are swapping the doses among the two pairs. Uh, in the real problem, this is a somewhat larger subgroup with 441 factorial elements, not two factorial elements. It's curious that eight is four times two, right? It's curious that uh, the magnitudes uh, in our set of permutation matrices uh, are uh, the product. Actually, it's not just the magnitudes. If I take a subset of uh, a group of permutation matrices, and I take another subset of a group of permutation matrices, uh, I can think about the product of the subsets, which is to say all of the permutation matrices I can form by taking one an S from S and one T from T, multiplying them together where order is important because permutation matrices don't commute. Uh, I'm, when I only have one element in, uh, let's say, T, uh, I'm going to drop the braces and just write ST. Uh, it's easy to check that our group of permutation matrices is actually the product of the sets of permutation matrices we were talking about, one with eight elements, one with two elements. Not only is it the product, but it's also a unique representation of the elements in the product. So every one of our treatment assignments has one representation in terms of first assign um, uh, people to smoke or control in a pair, and after you do that, assign a dose to the pair. So it's being unique is important because it means if I look at G, I can tell you what H and K are. Right? Uh, the, this is also true in our actual study. It takes a little more time to inspect the matrices and convince yourself it's true, but uh, uh, our actual study has 441 factorial times two to the 441 uh, treatment assignments and they're formed uh, from two subgroups. Uh, indeed, we don't need two subgroups. We have uh, w whatever we need whenever we have one subgroup, one group of treatment assignments, uh, permutation matrices, and a subgroup, H. From that, we can always construct uh, a set uh, which need not be a subgroup such that uh, every element in the group has exactly one representation as a product uh, of this form. Um, so this is analogous to experimental design where uh, we have uh, orthogonality of nominal factors. Um, we do this by uh, setting K equal to a system of distinct representatives of the cosets of our subgroup H. We can do this very generally, so there are lots of evidence factors. Anytime the universe has a symmetry and a subsymmetry, there are two evidence factors. What's a probability distribution on a group? Well, list all the group elements are all of our treatment assignments and attach probabilities to each of them, right? And we've been doing that all along. Uh, a randomized experiment means what? We randomly assign, so that means all of the group elements, all the treatment assignments have the same probability. Uh, this resembles what we were doing uh, before, uh, but we were doing it first on K, smoker control, then on H, doses of treatment assignment. Now we're talking about the joint distribution uh, of doing both at once. We need to talk about the marginal and conditional distributions. Uh, so remember we have for each element in our treatment assignments, they have a unique representation of a product of assign smoker control, assign an amount smoke to uh, uh, the pair. Uh, what's the marginal distribution of the smoker control assignment K? Well, that's I sum over the probabilities, right? I sum the joint distribution over the probabilities. So this is the first lecture in stat one, right? If I have several mutually exclusive events and I wanna know the probability that any one of them occurs, I sum over the probabilities of the, uh, those events. That's the way I get a marginal distribution. First lecture in stat one. 
How do I get a conditional distribution of H of dose assignments given that I have assigned smoker control? I take the joint distribution and I divide it by the marginal distribution that gives me the conditional distribution. That was the second lecture in STAT 1, right? I wanna go the other way. I wanna start with what we did before, namely we had a marginal distribution for smoker control. We had a kind of conditional distribution for uh, uh, the um, uh, dose assignments. I wanna build joint distributions from it. Right? Um, so we did a sensitivity analysis for smoker control, ignoring doses. We did uh, an analysis where we fixed who were the smokers and then considered uh, the uh, relationship between the doses and the difference in outcomes uh, for smoker control. So I now want to build the joint distributions that correspond with those two analyses. And I want to do that without adding any assumptions. The assumptions in the first sensitivity analysis, the assumptions in the second sensitivity analysis, no new assumptions at this stage. It's natural to think first about having one distribution in P and one distribution in P prime, one distribution for K, one distribution for H, what would it be in that case? This is a very obvious example. It's important, it's correct, but it's also very misleading, and we'll see why. Um, a marginal distribution um, of P on K and a conditional distribution of P prime on H are picked to give us the joint distribution. Um, the urge is almost overwhelming to multiply it. Right. It feels like this is the third lecture in STAT 1, that you get the joint distribution by multiplying a marginal distribution by a conditional distribution. But can you see what's wrong with that? Um, that statement is the third lecture in STAT 1 as heard by somebody who wasn't paying attention. Okay. What's wrong with that is if I say I have two distributions, a marginal distribution and a conditional distribution, I just have two of them. What am I saying? I'm saying that the conditional distribution is the same no matter what happens on uh, the uh, thing I'm conditioning on. But if I say that the conditional distribution is the same no matter what I condition on, I'm saying the two pieces are independent. And that's precisely the assumption I didn't want to make, right? So this structure where there's only one distribution in each set and I'm picking one marginal distribution and one conditional distribution and multiplying them is adding an unwanted assumption of independence. Um, in this example, uh, the assumption of independence would mean deciding to smoke and deciding to smoke lots of cigarettes are independent. And that's not an assumption we want to make. It could be that there's a gene that promotes smoking and when people smoke, they smoke a lot and we don't want to assume that they're independent. So you don't build the joint distributions by picking a marginal distribution and a conditional distribution from P prime and multiplying them. That adds the assumption of independence. There's a new but obvious construction of the joint distributions. I say it's new because I haven't seen it before, but it's so obvious it must have been invented dozens of times before. Um, let's build one distribution and then we'll build all of them. How do we build one distribution, one joint distribution? Well, we pick a marginal distribution for smoker control we pick a, for each possible pattern of smoker control, we pick a conditional distribution from our set of conditional distributions for the doses. But we could pick different sets of different conditional distributions depending on what happened in our uh, smoker uh, control assignment, depending upon K. So the conditional distributions may depend on K. And we put the result in P double prime as a, as a joint distribution. This is called the knit product of two distributions. We do this in every possible way, every possible combination, and that set of distributions is the knit product. Uh, just to emphasize how different these two things can be, suppose I just had two distributions in P. I always have infinitely many. But suppose I have three distributions in P prime, and our set K has four possible outcomes, as it does in smoker control in my toy example. Um, the mistaken answer, which imposes independence, says I got two choices from here and three choices from here, so I have six distributions. Those are all legitimate distributions, but they've imposed the additional assumption of independence. The knit product says there's two distributions in here uh, for the marginal distribution of smoker control. For each of the four levels of smoker control decisions, that we have three choices of conditional distributions for the doses, 
making two times three to the fourth or 162 joint distributions in the knit product. So the knit product is already a lot bigger than the um, uh, independence kind of a product, uh, uh, even when we have such a small structure here. Paul, um, yes. Interrupted. You have around uh, six to seven minutes left. Great, thank you. Uh, we're going to add one assumption about our test statistic. The test statistic for the first factor, which was Wilcoxon's statistic, um, is going to be invariant to H. That is, change H, change the dose assignments, uh, it doesn't change the statistic. That's obviously true, right? Wilcoxon's statistic ignored the doses, didn't use them, so it's invariant. So this is an assumption, but it's an assumption we can check because it's about our test statistic, not about the world. Um, so the sign rank statistic qualifies. Uh, if we know the um, uh, true distribution of smoker control, we could uh, get the true distribution of Wilcoxon statistic. And we did that kind of reasoning to get our sensitivity analysis for uh, Wilcoxon statistic. And that gave us P bar, the upper bound on the P value for Wilcoxon statistic. We don't need any assumptions for this test statistic in factor two, the cross cut statistic. Uh, we're going to uh, compare it to its conditional distribution uh, given K. Uh, we did that before. Uh, we looked at the conditional distribution of the crosscut statistic given who was a smoker. Um, and we found the upper bound on the uh, p value uh, uh, for the crosscut statistic uh, working separately. Uh, so, combining these uh, features, what do we have? The structure so far is we have a group of treatment assignments. It can be represented uh, as the product of two sets, one of which is a subgroup, and that representation is unique. And our test statistic is invariant to the action of the subgroup. And all of that's true in the example we were looking at. We're going to test twice. We're going to test no effect uh, using the marginal test, smoker control, the Wilcoxon test. Uh, we're going to test again using the conditional distribution of the crosscut statistic, our second test statistic. We get two values uh, for the upper bounds on the p values. And this is the main proposition. The main proposition says, if the distribution of smoker control uh, is one of our distributions in the sensitivity analysis uh, uh, for smoker control, if the conditional distribution of the doses given smoker control is one of our conditional distributions in the cross-cut sensitivity analysis, then the joint distribution of the, uh, um, for every joint distribution in the knit product, the pair of upper bounds on the p-values uh, is stochastically larger than the uh, uniform distribution on the unit square. Uh, and so we can combine them as if they came from independent studies. Right? So the implication is that for all practical purposes, I can act as if these two p-values came from two unrelated studies. Um, I'm just going to give an indication very quickly of the nature of the proof. Uh, we remember we built the knit product as all possible joint distributions that we could get from the two marginal sensitivity analyses. The first lemma says the sensitivity analysis we did for Wilcoxon's test, which found the worst P in the marginal distribution, actually is the same as the sensitivity analysis we would have done on the joint distribution. So moving from the marginal distribution to the joint distribution in the knit product gives us the same sensitivity analysis. The second claim says the same thing about the crosscut statistic. The crosscut analysis we did before, which was just working with the conditional distribution, is exactly the same as the sensitivity analysis we would have done had we uh, been working with the knit product of the two distributions. Um, and then an easy standard kind of a result says that if you do a marginal test and you do a conditional test and the conditional test has level alpha for all things you condition on, then they're jointly stochastically larger than the uniform. Um, let me give you a very quick indication of another group. So another group might be, we don't want to permute smoking and con uh, smoker control over uh, pairs. Uh, what tends to happen is women smoke less than men, and also people tend to smoke less at later ages than they do at earlier ages as the health effects of smoking start to appear. So we might divide our 441, factor 441 pairs into four strata based on age less than 55 or age greater than 55 and male or female, four strata. That gives us um, a new group which only permutes pairs within strata, doesn't permute uh, doses uh, across strata. Uh, it's a smaller group, it's a subgroup of the previous group. That would give us four crosscut pictures. 
You notice the odds ratios are getting bigger when we stratify, like they're 16 and infinity in these couple of these, all the data is pretty thin. We could take the two by two by four cross cut table uh, and do a sensitivity analysis with that. So we have the unstratified analysis we looked at before and the p values. This is the stratified analysis where we're uh, allowing for age and gender differences in the pairs. You notice this stratified analysis is insensitive to larger biases than the unstratified analysis. And then that gets combined as before with the Wilcoxon analysis, which hasn't changed. Uh, and the combined analysis is substantially more insensitive to bias than the separate analyses, Wilcoxon at three and the cross cut analysis at 2.25 give us a combined p-value of 0.044, much smaller uh, than it would have been uh, at those gammas um, uh, for the separate analysis. So let me summarize. Uh, in an observational study, both biases and treatment effects uh, uh, can replicate across studies. So effective replication is not repetition. Don't do the study over again, vary the unmeasured biases. Uh, you'd like to disrupt the biases that existed in the first study to see if the treatment effect remains in place having disrupted those biases. Viewed in this way, a single observational study can replicate itself, performing several independent comparisons potentially affected by different biases. Uh, evidence factors are built from uh, a group of permutation matrices, a subgroup of that group, and a system of distinct representatives of the cosets of that uh, subgroup. Uh, so they exist in enormous variety wherever there's a symmetry and a subsymmetry. Uh, from this structure, we can have two sensitivity analyses that combine using meta-analytic techniques as if you did two independent studies, and the combined evidence is not only stronger in terms of sample size, because you doubled your effective sample size, but in addition, it's stronger in the sense that it can be in insensitive to larger biases than either of the component analyses when, in fact, the data warrant this. So let me close there, and I'd be delighted to have your comments and questions. Thanks, Paul. Um, so we're running a little low on time, so maybe one 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 quick question. So um, it seems like there's there's um, the, the 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 proof relies on the the fact that there are two factors, so you can decompose into two um, two groups. Is, is there any sense in thinking about more combining more observational studies with the perhaps uh, decomposition into more than two groups, or is there something fundamental about that structure? No, it can have an arbitrary number. Uh, the challenge is to find uh, contexts in which that's uh, meaningful, but they do exist. And I have a couple of examples with more than two. Uh, so for example, I have an example where uh, there are people who um, are uh, exposed or not, like the Wilcoxon analysis. Some people had more exposure and some people had less exposure, like the dose analysis. But uh, some people uh, who had a lot of exposure also took precautionary measures that reduced the harm of those exposures, and that gave three evidence factors. So that can okay. easily happen, and I think it's just a matter of uh, creativity in finding situations like that where there are multiple um, uh, studies within a given single study. Okay, thank you. All right, fantastic. Uh, Thank you, Paul. Uh, I think it's time now to wrap up. Uh, yeah, thank you, Paul, for the for the great talk and for volunteering to to speak today. Um, thank you for also, having me. Thank you very much to uh, to Dylan for helping us in uh, in Q and A. Second. Um, yeah. So next week we have uh, Dean Eccles from uh, MI2 who will speak about noise-induced randomization and regression discontinuity designs. And as a discussant, we have Michael Collisar from Princeton. We are very much forward looking to next week and hope to see you all there. Uh, yeah, then uh, that's it from us uh, today. Uh, hope to see you all next week and hope you all are, are safe uh, in this uh, social climate. Thank you all for joining.